This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. A vast universe exists within and beyond our reality. What we realize with our five senses is but a tiny fraction of all that is real. Welcome to the World Beyond Radio Show. I'm Joe Wegent, your guide and advocate. As we remove the blinders of our everyday lives, unplug from the matrix, and experience together all that exists out there in the world beyond our world. Welcome to our show today, my friends. Today, our special guest is Vanessa Hurst. Vanessa Hurst lives in Louisville, Kentucky at this moment. She was born and raised in a German Catholic community of Ferdinand, Indiana, and she has always been an intuitive. In college, she studied forensic studies and received a double major in religious studies as well. And this sparked a lifelong study of studying and living different spiritual paths. After 13 years, she returned to Ferdinand to work at the Sisters of St. Benedict Retreat Center. She worked there for 14 years, and she learned all about the Desert Fathers. She became a Reiki master, and she focused on the sacred and extraordinary in her own life. She also trained in the healing touch, medical intuition, quantum healing, five element form Tai Chi, and a master's degree in natural health. Vanessa then began to facilitate programs in these disciplines, and she wrote three Reiki manuals in the process. From 2007 to 2012, she worked in Louisville at the Merton Institute for Com Contemplative Living, where she continued the contemplative lifestyle and she learned uh, that, that she learned at the retreat center. She wrote her first book, Engaging Compassion through intent and action. The book shares a template for living in awareness. Through mindfulness, we are able to respond compassionately to the world around us. Her second book, A Constellation of Connection, Contemplative Relationships, focuses on the three elements of a mindful relationship, silence, compassion, and communion. Vanessa's third book in process will be on intuitive awareness, listening to our intention or intuition. Vanessa describes herself as an intuitive, a contemplative, and a mystic. Welcome to our show today, Vanessa. How are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, the, the pleasure is all on this side of the mic, always. So what is a contemplative? What does that mean for us today? For me, a contemplative is someone who is actually looks at life or has life with a focus on the attention to the awareness of the sacred or the extraordinary. Because for me, the sacred means different things for different people. So it's just those things that we hold in deep reverence or really see as extraordinary. So it's a, a way of going into life and saying, instead of walking to my car in the morning what I actually do when I walk to my car is really notice everything around me and what's popping out at me. So what is the extraordinary in our lives? Well, how do we distinguish that from just going about our everyday lives? I, I like to say that what we do with the extraordinary is, is that we spend time reframing or rescripting our lives. So when something challenging happens to us, instead of getting stuck in the challenge or, or instead of getting stuck in a woe is me, we we look for something that is very positive. And so one of the one of the things that I like to share is is that when I worked at the Merton Institute, 
it actually closed its doors. The corporation dissolved in December of 2012. And so I woke up January 1st of 2013 without a job. And so instead of being stuck in the fact of, of scarcity that I didn't have a steady income coming in, I found the extraordinary in that it gave me time to volunteer. It gave me time to write that first book. Um, it gave me time to create relationships. So it was a different way of looking at what was happening. Um, the extraordinary shows us where the possibilities are in our lives as well. And it gives us an opportunity really to listen to our intuition in a very different way. We don't miss the cues that are guiding us through our life when we're able to see the extraordinary. Well, throughout our show today, I really want to get into uh, more about listening to our intuition and how to expand upon that. So how does a mystic live a life as opposed to a contemplative? Okay, I think that a mystic and intuitive and a contemplative are all are all different words for the same thing. So what, what a mystic does is consci- is consciously look for the mystery um, that that basically is in the extraordinary. So what we're we're always doing is is looking for the the beauty. And for me, um, the mystery the mystery for me of life was one day when I was when I was driving, I saw a um, I saw a squirrel that was dead on the road. But I also I also saw another squirrel that was standing over that body, like it like like was in like the uh, the first squirrel, the second squirrel, the squirrel that was alive was grieving. And so for me, it was to actually see the mystery that we don't understand. We sometimes think that we're the most intelligent species in the world. But for me, it was to take a look at what was happening with those two squirrels. Well, I want to get back to that in just a second, but we do have to cut away to our first break. My friends, you're listening to the World Beyond Radio Show. And this hour, we are talking with Vanessa Hurst on intuition. We'll be right back in just a moment. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good to Be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. 
Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? Why are crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere? Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Welcome back to the World Beyond Radio Show. I'm your host, Joe Wegent, and this hour we are speaking with Vanessa Hurst and talking about intuition and a contemplative lifestyle. Vanessa, what is an intuitive conversation and why would someone want to schedule one? Okay, and an intuitive conversation is what I call um, we enter into neural synchrony, which means that I basically connect with the other person um, on an energetic level and surface. We talk about current life challenges. We talk about long term life lessons, because I believe that we've all come in to this life wanting to learn certain things in order to advance. We um, might also talk about soul purpose. So really, why are we here? Um, If you have questions about why you're in certain relationships, we will have conversations about that. So really, what the purpose is, is for the person to gain clarity about what's going on in their life. And what what I say is, is that we, I uh, use my vision to engage their wisdom, because anytime that it is a true conversation between the two of us, I just don't give people information. I ask questions to help that information why rise up and to rise up from them. And so I always tell people that the best thing that can happen is at the end of a session is for someone to say to me, you didn't tell me anything that I didn't already know, because that's really what I'm doing is, is I'm tapping into their knowledge. Um, so the goal would be for them to work on whatever we've whatever we've discovered. I also might use some energy techniques where um, I can clear past life trauma, I can clear some things that are going on currently in the life are currently in their life, and that's when I work in the quantum, which is the space between the um, mental, spiritual, and emotional, and the physical. And so it's it's just an opportunity, really, to um, begin to have somebody take a look at what's going on in their life, and then how can they make really positive changes that will impact the whole of their life. That sounds just exactly like the things that I do with uh, uh, Reiki sessions and with tarot card readings is tell people what they already know about themselves and allow them to realize that for themselves. That's that's very interesting. What how does that how does that work in a session whenever you're going back and forth with someone like that? You know what? I, I'll tell you sometimes sometimes I what I find is and I tell people that I am an intuitive, not a psychic because I'm I'm very clear about letting people know that if you want to know when that when the 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 man of your dreams is coming into your life or when uh, you're going to get that fin- fantastic job sometimes that kind of stuff happens but I can't guarantee that more um more it really once people get into the rhythm where they're really going going to discover kind of the why behind things and then realize that they they really can empower themselves that I'm just a guide and a facilitator 
um, it goes it goes really um, I think people are really excited about it. It's also what I've discovered is, is that a, a good portion of my clients actually decide to go into the intuitive training that I offer because they really recognize that they're intuitive and they want to be able to use it regularly in their life. They want to be able to listen to what what is going on and then respond to it. I've also felt that uh, telling people that you have psychic uh, abilities or psychic uh, skills tends to uh, create kind of like a bad connotation there as well. Intuitive is a much more friendly word when you're dealing with people because then they don't expect you to give them winning lottery numbers. <laughs> Exa- exactly. And so I just kind of I, and I, I hope that people who consider themselves psychic aren't offended. But I just have found that that's an easier way for me to kind of draw the line to let people know what I do and how it's different. So how do you encourage people to listen to their own intuition? Um, well, it was it's interesting because you talked about all five of the senses. Um, what I really do is I think I make them more aware of the fact that we don't just have five senses. We actually have, and there are probably more than this, we actually have 19 senses. So um, I will just share different things to them. Like some people know when the weather's going to change, and that's actually um, barometric sense. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's again, it's, it's talking, it's also talking to people about if you wind up meeting somebody, we've all met somebody that is our, be- that we know is going to be our best friend. And so we enter into a relationship with them. Well, how often do we meet somebody and everything in our mind is saying run, but we tell ourselves that's being mean or it's telling us 10,000 different things. So we stay. So what I do is, is I really encourage people to do full, full body listening to figure out exactly what's going on. So is your um, is your gut tightening up or do your shoulders tighten up? And, and what is that telling you? Because it's really, um, our intuition really manifests in our body. So just to really to encourage people to begin to listen to that. And then, um, then I always tell them, you know what, if your intuition is telling you to do something that is not a danger to yourself or others, just do it. Because worst case scenario is, is, is that it wasn't your intuition, but it was a distraction. So it's really okay if you're, if you're checking this out, because becoming more intuitive is all about trial and error as well. How do you convince people to stop rationalizing or or uh, using logic to get around what their intuition is telling them? Well, you know what I there I also use um, Howard Gardner's eight intelligences, and one of the intelligences is logical mathematical. So I really tell people it's okay if you're using your logic to try to figure out if it is intuition. But but the big thing, Joe, is is for you to discover or for the person to discover if what they're getting is a distraction or if what they're getting is intuitive. And so it's really a part of we don't most people that I work with really don't like being in their physical bodies. But it's more about learning how our our spirit and our emotions and our and our thoughts are impacting our body and then learning if those are distractions and there are specific tells if if it's a distraction and those are unique for each of us or if it's really um, an intuitive nudge. And so it's it's even to ask people to do. And this is where the, this is where my contemplative lifestyle comes in, too, is that it's really important that we foster silence in our life. And that doesn't mean that it's a cessation of noise or that there can't be any words, but we've got to have what the Buddhists call a quiet mind. And when we have a quiet mind, we can rest in that and we can really begin to get down, to get down below it. But that takes a lot. I just think it takes a lot of practice. I tell people that when I started, when I did my medical intuitive training, the woman after the first class said to us, you can come back next week and take the second level, you're all ready. Well, this little voice inside my head said, if you come back, it's going to be like you've done everything in your life before where you get all of this knowledge, but you don't put it into practice. And so I waited six months between the first and second session. And I did what were called therapeutic body scans. I did 90 of those. Anybody that would let me do a body scan, I did it. And so I really tell people that it's not... It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Whenever you use your intuition, you just have to rest with it. And as you grow along with it, 
learn kind of how your body's speaking to you. And by body, I mean all four aspects speaking to you. I've noticed in my work that as a general rule, uh, women are much more in tune with their intuition than men are on, on the average as a general rule. But what I find in a lot of my female clients is that they uh, either work or live in an environment where a man in their life or a male coworker has dismissed or diminished their intuitive knowledge by either dis- diminishing the woman herself or dismissing her intuition as nonsense because the logic speaks around that. How can we in- encourage women to be more uh, uh, vocal and more assertive with what they're feeling with their intuition? Oh gosh, I think that I think that's the issue. Um, that's the issue in the world today. If we could figure out how to do that, because I think um, I think that a, an intuitive woman is um, is a strong woman and is also always viewed as a threat to a lot, not always, but is viewed as a threat in some ways because people are intimidated by her. And so what I would say is, is that um, you just have to be comfortable in your own skin. And again, sometimes um, ask yourself, do I need to share that information or is that information for me? Um, and so some could be the other things I talk about are, are the the ethical uses of intuition. And so just becoming comfortable with who you are. It's a, I know that when I started doing this work that my family really thought that I was very strange. And I have a friend's husband calls me the voodoo queen now because of the things that I do. But what I decided was, was that I needed to surround myself with people who believed in what I did. And that core group of people kind of gave me the courage and the strength to go out and do the other things. But it's also, um, I think what what somebody told me about something else is that it's also kind of um, growing a thicker skin and knowing, you know, really feeling comfortable with who you are. And then there, I would recommend a book that that really uh, kind of set things for me was by a woman named Mona Lisa Schultz, who is a um, actually a medical intuitive and a trained doctor. And it's called The New Feminine Brain. And so if you sit down and you read that, you really do understand that women are wired differently, not that men can't use their intuition, but that, uh, but just, just, I guess, becoming more comfortable with who you are. Now, what is the difference between um, someone who is intuitive and someone who is a spirit medium? How do those two different uh, aspects uh, coalesce or are they so different that they don't work together at all? You know, I, I'll tell you, Ted Andrews, um, I don't know if you've ever read, he wrote a book called Animal Speak. And what I think is interesting is that he talks a lot about spiritual mediums and they um, they actually connect with, I'm going to call beings from another plane of existence. Mm-hmm. And what I see is, is as an intuitive, I don't necessarily connect with a being from another a, from another plane of existence, what what I do as an intuitive is I access what I think is the connection to um, to the beyond, and it's it's something. There's a, a a kabbalistic term that's called the Einsof, which is also the great nothingness. And so I feel like that with my intuition is that I'm not necessarily tapping into a being; I'm tapping into another realm that has information and so somebody might say that's the akashic records so it's so i think that's probably the difference for me is that maybe i'm walking into a library but a medium might be talking to a librarian outstanding i love that analogy so how how do we bridge the uh the intent to action I think every morning when you wake up, you need to ask yourself, what is my intent? And then you need to set your intent. And and some people do that through prayer. Some people do that just through an affirmation. And then what you do is it's through mindfulness throughout the day. You go back to it and you ask yourself, you know, what part of that followed your your intent? So I always laugh because I, I, I because I talk about compassion and I tell people the biggest issue I have with being compassionate is when I get behind the wheel of my car. It's like everything goes out the window then. And so in a lot of ways, when I set my intent to be compassionate or to really look for ways to alleviate suffering, 
when I do something that I know is not based upon my intent, I just ask myself what part of that was compassionate. And so, so for me, it's, it's ongoing. It's, it's being, it's having those foundational awarenesses. And then it's to, in my book, what I do is, is I talk about the four pillars and it's, you've got to be present. You've got to be. Well, I want to get back to those four pillars here in just a moment, but we have to cut away to our break. My friends, you're listening to the world beyond radio show. I'm your host, Joe Wegent. And this hour we are speaking with Vanessa Hurst. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. are our personal gateways into infinite wisdom. Don't miss Shamanic Counselor and Indigenously Trained Dream Decoder Sandra Corcoran's inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles Sandra's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers and her initiations throughout the Americas and across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. Sandy's knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth influenced her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private tarot readings, international journeys, a meditative CD, as well as her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate this earthwalk, creating a deeper connection to yourself and all that is. Find this and more at Sandy's website, starwalkervisions.com. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen. Welcome back to the World Beyond Radio Show. 
I'm your host, Joe Wegent, and this hour we are speaking with Vanessa Hurst. Vanessa, right before we left for break, you were speaking about the four pillars in your book that you've written. Can you go into that again, please? Yes, I will. I I think that we all need to be mindful, which is all about being in the moment. But once we're in the moment, it's it's not just going from task to task. It's really beginning to understand who we are, which is the second pillar. So that means that what we really need to do is is figure out why we sometimes react and what and I call that a fear filled reaction or why we intuitively respond in maybe loving, gentle, compassionate ways, no matter how uh, all of our fears or angers are being triggered. But in order to do that, we really have to live with the third pillar, which is curious daring and and so life is what i i think sometimes whenever i'm out and about and i kind of feel nudged to talk to somebody you're always afraid if it's a stranger how the stranger is going to respond to anything that you say but with curious daring you're just out there you've got cure you 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 are courageous and you're just living life what in the extraordinary which is what we talked about before is that you're really willing to live that way but the and then the fourth pillar is really to take a long intentional look at your life. And so part of what we're doing is, is that we've got to look at it with anything that that happens in our life. I view everything that happens as a challenge and a life lesson. So really to take a long intentional look at our life might be whenever, whenever I no longer had a job on January 1st, 2013, instead of me saying to myself, Oh, whoa, is me. This is, this is the life that I've had. This is the, this is the constraints. When I took that long intentional look, I saw all of the possibilities. And so I really lived within those possibilities. But if we, if we look at the bridge template that I've created, really the only way that we can live those is by living mindfully, having contemplative practices or mindful practices. The bridge that I've created is a suspension bridge. And so really the only way, a suspension bridge, if you look at the cables, that's what keeps the bridge healthy. So for me, it's we can we can have those four pillars, but unless we have downtime, either what I call formal, informal, or spontaneous contemplative practices, we're not going to be able to be in the moment. We're not going to understand who we are. And so a formal contemplative practice might be something like meditation or going for a walk or journaling those things that um, we set aside time during the day. And so those are important because they do create what I call anchor points. And then in the spans between those anchor points, maybe, you know, we're feeling a lot of tension or stress. And so we get up and we take a five minute walk, or we might just sit at our desk and focus on our breathing for 90 seconds. So those in those informal practices really ground us in the moment. And then the spontaneous practices are what I call compassionate action. And so that might be even opening a door for somebody, having a conversation with somebody, just doing something nice for yourself. And so if we can live in awareness, those live through the four pillars, but make sure that we have um, enough contemplative practices happening in our life that we really are living as much as we can 24 seven as a contemplative, then we really do connect our intent with our actions more often than not. The, uh, the the Buddhist uh, method of thought is to live so much in the moment that even the last sentence that you've spoken uh, is in the past and cannot be uh, retrieved, and we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't worry about what happened in the past or feel remorse or guilt about the past. And in the same way, we shouldn't look to the future with fear or anxiety or trepidation, but living in that moment. Uh, how is that different from the contemplative lifestyle or the lifestyle that you learned when you were at the uh, the retreat at uh, uh, Ferdinand? Well, you know what? If you're a contemplative, you live in the moment, and that's that's what that that's really what happens. But the but the reality is is that it's it's to learn to let go of the past. I think it's also as a contemplative, you recognize those moments when you get caught in the past. Are you recognize those moments when you're reaching for the future and instead of beating yourself up over it, you just accept it and do your best to let it go. And so it's it's a matter of um, 
I've developed these things I call the four nons, and there's really nothing new about them. It, it's it's the way that I, I have combined things. And they're, it's funny that you say Buddhist because they are very Buddhist in nature. By by non, I mean that we're not. it's not that we're clinging to something or we're pushing it away. We're being very objective about it. And so you when when something in the past comes up you're just non attached you're aware of how it's how it's impacting you you're aware of the judgments that you have but you're you're non judgmental you're not going to react out of what's going on you're um also non defensive because sometimes when when bad things happen to us we like to defend our right to be right but we're just non-defensive. We're we're being aware of how all of this is impacting us, but we're just non-defensive. And then the other non is being non-violent, which means that instead of like saying something super harsh or critical to someone else, our 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 internal monologue, we say a lot of nasty stuff to ourselves if we really listen, is to really begin to rescript that to something loving and gentle. And so it's really staying in the moment not holding on to the past or really worrying about what's going to happen in the future, but being aware of how those two things are impacting us, which really brings us into the present moment. The other thing, Buddhists talk about Shempa or what hooks us. And so sometimes for me as a contemplative, when I can't get out of something, I always say to myself, well, what is the Shempa? Because that's almost a key to pull me back into the moment because that that's that is a a big word for me because it's not an english word and it it kind of it moves me back into the present moment so i can take a look at what is that shampa doing to me and then almost in, get get in touch with my intuition and saying how is it hooking me how is it impacting me how can i move it out so it's training ourselves to respond as opposed to react exactly and that and that is that's lifelong it's also it's also knowing that the I think and I think the biggest thing is is with the training. I always tell people if you're mid leap into a reaction and you pull back, that's a win too. So it's it's not it's not looking at either or, and it's also beginning to look at the life is not black or white. It's looking at the spectrum, and when we tend to polarize, we lose all of that beauty in the middle. That's amazing. So how how do you bring those things into your intuitive awareness and your intuitive sense workshops? Um, you know, I what I usually do is a lot of what I do, I tell people that that all of my workshops are probably about 60 percent experiential. So I provide some input as to what we're doing and kind of explain it to them. Uh, I've done some work at the University of Louisville Med School. And so what they asked me to do, and this is funny because you talked about logical earlier, they asked me to bring in some science so that people could understand it better. So I usually um, talk about neuroplasticity and resilience and response flexibility and and get into a little bit of the um, of the science and the physical, the anatomy of all of this. And then we, uh, we begin by, by doing just simple, um, and I'm sure you do this with your classes, very simple grounding techniques or anchoring techniques and then shielding. Because it's, I, what I found is, is that if people can anchor and shield themselves, you, what you do is you, you electrify your your shield with awareness. Not not that somebody's going to come up and get electrocuted when they touch you, but that it's kind of like um, some people call it their spidey sense. You begin to tingle, so that you know what's going on. And so again, it's it's also really encouraging people to discover what they're experiencing. And then after we have the experience, I open it up and we spend. Um, for people who are comfortable, we spend time sharing and we do that as well because I speak from my own personal lived experience and I encourage people to share their lived experiences so that we can all better understand. Um, usually whenever I do grounding, I usually start with my start with the crown and move down into the feet and into the into the ground. And I had a woman come up to me and she goes, that's just not working for me, Vanessa. And what we discovered was she had to ground from the ground up. And and if she hadn't have shared that with me, we wouldn't have been able to share it with the group. And so it's I guess what I would say is this too is that my um all of my workshops basically really become group experiences. It's um I read somewhere that a master 
continues to be mastered by the subject. So I usually tell people in the beginning that I know I'm going to come away with at least one new thing that I've learned. And so I challenge them really to, to form a community of, um, of people who are learning together. Yes, because every time you teach, you learn something yourself. I love exactly. that. <laughs> I did the same thing with martial arts. I would always put somebody up there and say, you teach this person something. And then they became a better student and a better martial artist because they taught something and had to break it down for the, the person who was inexperienced at it. So what life experiences can cause a burst of intuitive awareness and how can you maintain that knowing after uh, the you know the, the bubble pops how, how do we get to that i you know i think that that probably times of crisis will give you the uh, the biggest burst i remember that uh, it's been about 15 years ago my mother suffered a profound stroke and after that happened, I actually had always been able to see, but more, I hadn't been able to see real, um, I more waverings. It's like you're driving down the road and you see the heat coming up after she had had her stroke. I actually was able to see more things. I was actually able to, um, there was an angel in the room with her that I, that I was able to see that was standing behind her. And so what I did was after that, I tried to, consciously look for those things again once you once you see something or once you recognize it it's with with any of your senses really begin to then see if you can recreate what you've seen and and that's the best thing that i that's the that's the best advice that i can give what i've also discovered is is that after those big bursts it's kind of like anything if you have this surge of of energy and then it goes back down your abilities are tamped down a bit, but as long as you continue to look for things, look for what I call the extraordinary, then you really begin to notice them in a different way. And so I always encourage what I call taking two steps back and just resting in the silence and noticing what you're noticing and then not being, not being really freaked out about it. Um, I also think I'm a, I'm a big writer I'm a journaler, so I spend a lot of time journaling about the things that I've seen. And there is a connection that is there is a connection between writing or between kinesthetics and what you're what you are seeing. It's another way of processing. So it's really to discover um, how you access your 19 senses and then really how you process that information and then to just play with it. I mean, that's the other thing is that don't take it like it's a, a serious, serious thing. Just have fun and play with it. So in a way, if we try too hard to feel it, we won't feel it. But if we just relax, it comes to us. Right. Because if you, if you think about it, if what happens whenever you get a knot in a chain that you're, you're wearing around your neck. If you, if you keep pulling at it, it just gets tighter. But if you allow it to relax and you relax, you can undo the knot. That is perfect. I, I like that analogy. Well, we're going to cut away to our last break today. Folks, you are listening to the World Beyond Radio Show. I'm your host, Joe Weijin, and this hour we are talking with Vanessa Hurst on intuition and the contemplative lifestyle. We'll be right back in just a moment. Please stay tuned. Are you curious? Do you want to learn more about how the world works and have fun at the same time? Study coincidences with me, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, on my Connecting with Coincidence radio show here on the XZBN network. Listen to Jungians theorize, statisticians randomize, true believers evangelize, while I categorize. I dance to the rhythm of coincidences. People who experience me see more of them. Maybe something on the show matches a thought in your mind. Let us know. Expand your mind to the weirdness happening around you. Synchronicity spoken here, there, and everywhere. 
For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence in your search engine and find my website, my social media sites, and my blog. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back to the World Beyond Radio Show. I'm your host and guide, Joe Wegent. As always, our show is produced and distributed by the ever-expanding leader in New Age, Paranormal, Alternative Health, and Supernatural Programming, the X-Zone Broadcast Network, and Rel Mar McConnell Media Company at their corporate headquarters and master control in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. To learn more about the World Beyond Radio show, your host, or to discover a wealth of other amazing shows and their hosts, please visit www.xzbn.net. To contact me to inquire about being a guest on The World Beyond, please email me at Joe Wegent, that's Joe, W-E-I-G-A-N-T, at xzbn.net. Or you can visit my websites, www dot paranormalpeace dot com and www 
Reiki Choice. That's R E I K I Choice dot com. Or you can visit any of my pages on Facebook. Our guest this hour has been Vanessa Hurst. Vanessa, would you please tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you? Yes, they can uh, get a hold of me. Well, they can go to my uh, website, www.intentandaction.com. I N T E N T A N D A C T I O N dot com. Follow me on Twitter at, at Fire Serpent. They can follow me on uh, Facebook, either Vanessa Hurst or Intent and Action. Also, they can uh, send me an email at Vanessa at Intent and Action dot com. Perfect. I've noticed over the years in my work that a, a lot of um, a lot of people will send me uh, photographs or they will uh, describe to me that they're young, young children from about uh, the age of vocalization up to about four years old. They will begin to notice things in the room. They will pick up on things. They may even start talking about some of their past lives. Uh, how do we encourage these young children to, to stay in contact with that kind of uh, intuitive uh, graspings? And how can we uh, convince the, the parents of these children not to dismiss or diminish these kinds of responses? Um, I have a son who is going to be 21 in August, and I have never not told him that he could not see the things that he was seeing. So um, I have, I have um, kind of brought him up to just be with the energy, to be with his intuition and to listen to it. And so as a parent, I can say that the, the best thing that we can do with our children is whenever they see something is, is to not negate that and not to, um, not to lead them on, but to ask questions, to encourage them to actually share with us what they're seeing and what they're, what they are, what they're viewing. Now, I will tell you that when he went to first grade, that he and a group of his friends were sharing the things that they could see in the lunchroom. And it didn't go over well with the other children because even by the even by the time these children are six and seven years old, they're shut down by their parents. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is, is that then I had to talk to him about there are certain things that you cannot talk to with other people. So it was even at at the age of seven, I was teaching him how to be more discerning about who he shared with. But you never negate what they're experiencing. Always encourage them and leave it very open. I am. Um, one of my students, I've worked with her because she's got two very, she's got two children who are four or five now that see things. And so she said it was, and she's actually a doctor. So I had to kind of laugh at it because she's really into her intuition now. Um, but she is talking with me and talking with her children in ways now that she's really encouraging them to not lose that. So it's almost like we've got to put a protective bubble around them so that they can experience it, but then also begin to help them learn how who do who it's safe to share with and who it's not so shit safe to share with. Perfect. So in life, are there really any coincidences or is everything a divinely inspired synchronicity? I think that everything is a divinely inspired synchronicity. I, you know, and I, I think that, um, I, I kind of um, I really believe that things happen and that what we need to do is find the the blessing or the lesson in what happens. And it's a, it's hard sometimes whenever those are elongated or whenever um, you discover someone. There was a, a woman when I first started, when I first actually learned Reiki that I was sharing Reiki with that um, had um, breast cancer and she had done everything by the book, scientifically, she um, she breastfed, she ate right, she'd done everything with it. Well, I was sharing Reiki with her, and I kept praying that she would be healed. Well, what I was really praying for was that she was cured. And I said that at the end of her life, she wound up dying, but she died really in peace and had a lot of joy. But that was a great lesson for me as well. And I, I really believe sometimes you don't get the end result you want, but you've got to, again, always be reframing and rescripting what you've got to really find the blessings in it. So speaking on that topic, what is our death experience really like? Um, 
I actually have the ability to see what people how what happens whenever people die, um, which I call um, a, the I call a circle, a doorway in the hand of a trusted one. And so um, when my when my mother died, and when I've had other people die, I've really been able to see that we have three concentric circles. One of them is the circle of the living. One of them are what what look like celestial beings to me, like like angels that are probably ten or twelve feet high, and then you have a group of people that begin to walk in that are those people that really impacted the person who is dying's life. And so, when someone dies, I said that there's always a hand of the trusted one, someone that in your life you had a profound connection with that you really really trusted, who will take your hand and lead you through the door. Because what my understanding is, is that when you take that first step in, I was I was raised Catholic. And so we talk about purgatory and we talk about hell. I said that first step, everything that you've done to hurt somebody or hurt yourself becomes evident. And so the person who walks you through the, the doorway or the gate is holding your hand so that you can't bolt. Because after you take that next step, you understand why everything happened in your life, that it all happened to a reason to bring you to where you are today. When we start tapping into our intuition and we start gaining information that we wouldn't normally gain from our five physical sense, uh, senses, are we discovering a fate or a path that was laid out for us by the universe? Or are we literally steering the rudder of our own ships to the shores of our own creation? Okay, there is a... There is a uh, there is a uh, Kabbalistic myth that I really believe in it, in that the beginning, before we come into this life, that we actually sit, sit at a table and we choose our own life lessons. And so that's what I really believe is that sometimes I believe, though, because we're in the spirit that we bite off a little bit more than we can chew. So whenever we get down here, we realize that it's not as easy to learn these lessons as we thought it was. So in that way, I really believe that everything that happens is 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 to really advance us spiritually. You use the night sky as a metaphor for relationships. Explain that. OK, it's. I really believe that what we have to do, in our, and I've talked about silence before, is that we have to create a, a environment of silence in our life so that we have clarity. Um, by relationship, I talk about relationship with ourself, others, the sacred and all of creation. And so the night sky for me, all those twinkling stars are actually each of our divine sparks that at the at the um, initiation of our creation, that the, the creator carved off a piece of itself and blew that piece into us, which is our divine spark. And that's what we connect with one another that divine spark. But the way that we connect is we connect with communion, which is really a deep form of communication that can be words, but it's, it's wordless. It's in 19, in the 1960s, a study was done that said that 93% of our communication is all nonverbal, that only 7% of what we say is actually the words. And so we have to have that communion to strengthen how we are in relationship with other people. How do we gain clarity about our own life purpose then? You, you know, I think that that's lifelong. Sometimes you're going to need help. And so I have people come to me and we talk about their life purpose. Other times um, you, you can just, for me, it's a matter of, it's a matter of journaling. It's a matter of looking at what has happened into your life from the day that you were born to bring you here and where's the common thread and find that common thread. And I believe that will lead you to your life purpose. I believe that everyone that we meet in our lives, uh, we've, we've also been around in our previous lives. So, you know, our fifth grade teacher in one life might be our son or our wife in another life. Um, and I believe that every person that we know in the life that we're in now is there for a purpose to either teach us something or we to teach them something. What What are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with that. I And I, I think that, that that is very true, that everyone's going to. And I think I think everyone's going to teach us something and we're going to teach everyone something. I um I, I also believe that there are there are key figures in our life that probably have always been in our lives. And it's interesting because some of the uh, 
some of the conversations that I've held lately have been that there there are people that have had reoccurring like significant individuals in their in their past lives but this is this is the life to either make it or break it so this is the life to either let go that that relationship or really solidify it well it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the world beyond radio show and i hope we can do this again sometime my friends thank you for tuning in to the world beyond radio show i'm your host joe Weegent, and we have been talking with vanessa hurst have a wonderful day and we'll be back again